once it binds to antigens, it's going to do two things. It's going to act as a opsonin, or it's going to act as a neutralizing agent. So I'm just going to say it's going to neutral. It's going to make the neutral. If it's a virus, it's going to block that virus from getting into the cell. If it's a bacteria, it's going to block that bacteria's access to nutrients, or it's going to block uh, that bacteria's ability to move around. And because of this, because it binds to the antigens, think of all the types of places where you can have infections. So we got to be able to, we're going to be put under some pretty harsh conditions, pretty harsh environment that it's going to be subjected to. And so antibodies have to maintain their three-dimensional structure to maintain their function. So the way that they do that is the most important thing that they form is the disulfide bridges, bonds, which those are the two between to there, I think I spelled that wrong, leave me alone. The other thing that they have is really people underestimate the strength of beta sheets. And these basically are just forming hydrogen bonds, and I'm using quotations with my fingers here. Hydrogen bonds, remember that's an intermolecular force. And the other thing that they have is um, certain motifs or super secondary structures. Motifs, I'm just going to say that this is super secondary protein structures. So that's how they're able to retain their three-dimensional conformation in all kinds of environments that it's going to be in. I mean, think about all the different places where you can get infections. Acidic environments, alkalotic environments, anaerobic environments, uh, a lot of various, you know, P varying pHs, varying uh, alkalinity or salt concentrations. So we have to have ways of, of staying stable. So the two parts of the immunoglobulins, and hopefully I can fit this all in one page and I don't have to do two maps, are the light chains and the heavy chains. And for each and every one of these, there is the variable regions, there's constant regions, and then there's the specific isotypes that those determine. So for heavy chains, they have a, a variable domain, which I'm going to go ahead and uh, later on abbreviate that as VH, variable heavy. Um, they also have a constant domain, which is abbreviated CH for constant heavy. And the constant domains, um, for them, there's about three to four different types of them. And these three to four different types um, are really what define the isotype. The, hopefully you can see that. It defines the isotype. So what the isotype does, and what this is, is remember we said that's just the way that we classify it. So IG and then usually something will come here. What that something could consist of would be IgG, IgM, IgD, IgA, and then IgE. And then the specific isotype that's going to be associated with that, we just use the heavy chain and then we call it the Greek symbol. For, so for IgG, it would be Ig gamma. For IgM, it would be I, uh, Ig mu, or the heavy chain there. Delta, uh, alpha, and then epsilon. And what this does is the constant domain is the site that's going to bind to this is makes up the FC region, which is where phagocytes will recognize it, and then other plasma proteins will recognize it. This is the part that interacts with the immune system. So we'll uh, go ahead and collectively talk about um, all the heavy chains, and I'll talk about all the light chains, and then we'll link them two together. So for the heavy chains, for the variable domain, remember there's two subclassifications of the variable domain that consists of the, and I'm just going to go ahead and leave it in the abbreviation, the hypervariable domain, the hypervariable regions, and then the framework regions. So I'm just going to say HV and FR. So HV means hypervariable, FR means framework region. I'm going to say that like 10 times. Hypervariable and then framework region. So for the light chains, they have the exact same thing. They have a variable domain and they have a constant domain. But there's not three or four of those. For them, there's only really just one type of constant domain, at least there will only be one in the antibody. Um, and as for isotypes of light chains, the kappa and lambda, but the, our book didn't make a distinction between the functions of, uh, of those, whereas there is a huge difference functionally between IgG and IgA, which we'll talk about later. And just like with here, we have for the variable domain of, of light chains, there is a hypervariable region, which was illustrated by that graph there, and then there's a framework region. Now both Here's where it gets kind of frustrating is that the fact that both the hypervariable uh, and then the framework region both contain a disulfide bond and then they both contain beta sheets. But 
as you can imagine, the hypervariable region also has another function, which the framework is just that. It's, it's, it's a stabilizing factor. It kind of holds it in place. So again, over here, it is exactly the same. They both have, I'm just going to draw it out, disulfide bonds and beta sheets, which contribute to the overall structure. And then there's another thing. So what am I going to talk about right here? I will see if I can do this in blue, I guess, to circle what I'm talking about. And this whole thing down here, the three, the, so the, so the hypervariable domain of the light chain and the hypervariable hyper domain of the heavy chain. Both can come together to contribute to the three hypervariable loops. The sometimes called the complementary determining region because they're complementary with the epitope that you're binding to, and we abbreviate this as CDR, complementary determining region 1, complementary determining region 2, and then complementary determining region 3. I prefer to just to say HV1, HV2, and HV3, but for the purposes of the book, they use this nomenclature for all of it. So, 